Brilliant. Uh, good morning, folks. Uh, it is my pleasure to welcome you to the to the 25th anniversary of uh, Gaelt Network and our celebration, which was delayed earlier in the year. Indeed, we yeah. So we're now um, combining this also with the 12th annual memorial presentation in honor of Noel Walsh. Um, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce to you uh, uh, Frank Fian, Minister of State for Public Health, Wellbeing and the National Drug Strategy. And uh, Minister, I'm going to hand over to you now. Thank you. Well, look, again, I want to thank you all by, uh, for your kind invitation to speak at this webinar here today. I am aware that in previous years, my predecessors have attended the annual Gay Health Forum, which unfortunately could not be held this year due to pandemic 19. You all can see and hear me, is that right? Yes, yes absolutely. However, I really welcome the opportunity to, uh, which is my first time as Minister for Public Health, Wellbeing and the National Drug Strategy, to address you all online. I am looking forward to the possibility of being able to attend the forum and uh, I and I and uh, in in future in uh, in in, per, in person in future years, and we look forward to this next year. Uh, the various members of the organisations of the Gay Health Network, in par partnership with the HSC, are playing a vital role in implementing our national sexual health strategy. This includes work on sexual health awareness, in care and support services to the core community, and in the delivery of clinical counselling and preventative services targeting HIV and SCI prevention. And we are very grateful and appreciative of your hard work in this area. One area of concern to us all continues to be the rise in new diagnosis of HIV and other sexually transmitted infections. And as we approach this year's World AIDS Day, we take stock of where we are in the fight against HIV. The theme for this year is ending HIV uh, 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 resilience and impact. You will all be aware that last year saw the launch of two major initiatives in the fight against HIV in Ireland. The first of this saw Ireland joining the Global Fast Track Cities, which is aimed at boosting HIV prevention and treatment and reducing stigma. The second was the launch of the PrEP program, which will reduce the number of people who contact HIV in future. And this is a landmark program and a welcome addition to our efforts to combat HIV infections. I am aware that there have been logistical difficulties in the provision of some SCI services this year due to the impact of COVID-19, in particular with regards to the Gay Men's Health Service or GMHS. I know that work is ongoing with other services, stakeholders and community groups in order to provide the best possible service the GMHS service users under the current circumstances and my department is in regular contact with the HSE on this. In particular we welcome the assistance from James Street Hospital Guide Clinic in supporting GMHS service users at this time. At a national level I understand that staff recruitment is ongoing with regard to the dedicated provision of COVID-19 services and it is envisaged that this will enable staff from other health services, including GMHS, to return to their respective positions and resume service delivery in due course. These services are a core part of our national sexual health strategy key aims to improve sexual health and well-being across the range of sexual identities and to reduce negative health outcomes such as STIs and crisis pregnancy. A mid-term review of the strategy in 2018 found that implementation is going well. There is a great working relationship between voluntary and community groups such as the Gay Health Network and the HSE Sexual Health Crisis Pregnancy Programs who manage healthcare services covered by the strategy. This type of two-way communication and collaboration is so important for the great work that has been done in this area and I think it is important to acknowledge this. In addition to the initiatives I mentioned earlier, recent years have also seen developments such as expansion of the National Condom Distribution Service, additional sexual health training, new recommendations around relationships and sexuality education in schools, communications campaigns, the My Options support services, 
and the development of a general population survey on sexual health. This work has, of course, taken place against the background of a changing Ireland, one where we have more openness generally around sexuality and sexual health issues. While this is to be welcomed, we cannot afford to become complacent. We must continue with efforts to deal with stigma or dis discrimination, which had far-reaching harmful consequences. They can prevent people accessing medical assistance or counselling supports that they really need, resulting in the non-disclosure or late diagnosis of sexually transmitted disease infections. Therefore, I would like to congratulate the Gay Health, Gay Health Network on your 25 years of achievement since establishment in 1994. That great record continues today with the publication of a number of new reports and presentations during today's webinar. The work you do is essential in achieving our vision of improving the lives and health of the gay community. And it is vital to reaching people, improving health and re in reducing transmission of infection. It now only remains for me to thank you all again for all your valuable work and for me to wish you all the best with today's webinar. Thank you. Minister, uh, thank you so much for those very, very welcome words. Uh, in particular, the acknowledgement of the impact of COVID, particularly on the Gay Men's Health Service, but also your acknowledgement that we still face the challenge of, of stigma. And, and it is a sad feature of life that, that in fact, there is still so much stigma around sexually transmissible infections in general, and then uh, HIV in particular. So thank you, and we will do all that we can to contribute to, to that challenge and, and work to bring about more ways to reduce the stigma and to, to hopefully facilitate more and more people, particularly who have yet don't actually know that they're HIV positive, to encourage more, more people to test and to at least then know what their status is. Um, thank you so much. Um, are you in a position to stay with us for the rest of, of the webinar or? Um, I can. Yeah. What time is it? What time is the webinar over at? So we're going to be finishing up at one o'clock, uh, but we're having a break at just after around twelve. So I, I, can, I can stay until twelve. I have a meeting really? at twenty past twelve. That's great okay. stuff. That's and if, if I just might say, look, when this uh, uh, pandemic is over, I'm absolutely only too delighted to come and visit you or meet you or see at first hand. Uh, the service you, um, you, you deliver. So thank you. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Minister. Yeah. Uh, we're going to begin with the uh, Noel Walsh Memorial presentation, and we're, it, which is going to feature the EMIS 2017 Ireland Community Reports. Uh, the first presentation was due to have been delivered by Axel Schmidt, but unfortunately, due to family reasons, he isn't able to join us this morning. So Mick Quinlan, who is one of the coordinators, is going to give the presentation on his behalf. So uh, Mick, over to you. Thank you. I'll give you a uh, notice at seven minutes, okay? Just let me know if you can see. Can you see my screen? It's not sharing yet. Yes, yeah, sharing there. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can see it perfectly. Thanks, Mick. Okay. Um, I'd like to start. Uh, good morning, everyone, and also to thanks to the minister. Um, uh, as was mentioned, Axel couldn't do this today uh, for family reasons, so I'm doing as the coordination for the volume two. Um, so, as you know, the Imus took place. Um, there was one in 2010 and one in 2019, one in 25 language and the last one in 33 languages. And the first community reports for 2010 
um, uh, were launched and you can see the one on the, the, the community one. On community two, both myself, Daniel and Susan were involved in uh, for gay, the Gay Men's Health Service and Gay Health Network. And it was funded by the Sexual Health Crisis Pregnancy. And then in August uh, 2018, the first community report was done for IMIS 2017. And you can see this here. And today we're launching the, the uh, second community report uh, from 2017. So today's presentation around the key findings for the 13,000 HIV diagnosed respondents in 48 countries. And it's based on 10% um, of the, the overall 137,000 men who completed MS. And this is, this is going to be available. Uh, uh, it's actually up on the website today. So where did the people living with HIV and the respondents for 2017, this is where they live. So you can see um, the dark one is the 13 to 16 percent were H living with HIV, the dark, and then 9 to 12 percent, and then 6 to 8 percent. So um, the number of years diagnosed with HIV, one year, less than one year was 8 percent, two to five years was 31 percent, six to 15 years was 40 percent, and uh, over 16 years was 21 percent. And their ages range from 4%, 14, age 14 to 24, 36%, uh, 30, 25 to 39, and then the largest one was 40 to 54, then 12% for 55 to 64, and 3% for over 65s. Your HIV treatment, 96% of, of the men living with HIV had their HIV monitored in the previous six months. 90% were on antiretroviral treatment, and 82% had suppressed or undetectable viral load. The HIV care cascade showed better outcomes in the north and in the west of Europe than in the south and the east of Europe. And we already dealt with the age, so on migration and partnership, 18% of the men were not born in the country that they were living in, 51% were single, 7% uh, were not sure if they had a steady partner or it was complicated, but 42% had a steady partner. And among those 42% with a steady partner, 43% of them had a partner who also lived with diagnosed HIV. Then on knowledge on, on you equals you, 85% of the HIV positive men knew that a person with undetected viral loads cannot pass on HIV. Among all the respondents in MS 2017, it was 57%. So it was a higher knowledge amongst uh, men living with HIV. But again, we're saying this highlights the need for continued promotion around U equals U amongst gay and bisexual men in general, and in HIV positive gay men and our health providers in particular. Drug use. 6% of the men injected drugs, excluding steroids in the past year. And 70% use stimulant drugs to make sex more intense or last longer in the last four weeks. Percentage of HIV men who used these drugs in the previous year. So 63% used poppers, 46% used erectile dysfunction drugs, 34% used cannabis, 23% used ecstasy pills or powder, and 21% used cocaine, and 16% used sedatives or tranquilizers. And where men met up for the last time, they had sex with a non-steady male partner. So the smartphone and internet is the highest, then saunas, back rooms, public sex parties, cruising, private sex parties, nightclub discos, bars and cafes, porn cinemas. Of course, that's all affecting you with COVID. Your economic situation, 19% of were struggling financially and 7% were unemployed. 5% were retired and 4% were on long-term sick, sick. And then of the men who tested in the previous year, 15% had syphilis, 11% had gonorrhea, and 10% had chlamydia. And we would, in looking at this, see people can look at the previous reports or the main report and just do the comparison. So as I said, it's up on the website now and 
I'd like, to, on behalf of Axel and myself, we'd like to thank all the respondents, especially the men living with HTV, to Gay Health Network and to HSE Ireland for funding uh, support. And uh, of course, the core team for Missy. Thanks very much. Mick, thanks a million. And you are well within uh, your, your presentation time. Thank you. Uh, so uh, without further ado, I'd like to now move on to our, our second part of the of the Noel Walsh Memorial presentation. And, and so I'm going to hand over to Daniel McCartney. Daniel. Great. Thanks. Let me see if I can share my screen. I think we're all starting to get used to doing this. Yeah. I just want to get yeah. the whole thing up. Yeah. There we go. Perfect. But yeah, so thank you very much. It's great to be here. Uh, I really think this uh, is really a nice virtual reunion. I haven't seen many of you for quite some time. Um, so I'm really pleased to be able to present these two new Irish community reports for World AIDS Day. Um, similar to what Mick just presented, those community reports were really for all the survey respondents uh, in 40 plus countries. This was specifically additional reports where we wanted to share information to all the Irish uh, respondents as well. Um, but first, I just want to give you a brief history of some of the community reports developed uh, in our recent uh, Men Who Have Sex With Men internet surveys uh, that have been conducted in Ireland. So this even came from like way back when we did the first European survey, um, where previously, when we were doing, for people who've been around for a while, the real lies reports and such like that, we always sort of focused on one full report to highlight the survey, um, very much for programmers and researchers and such. And I think what we re realized uh, in 2010 was like we wanted to see was there a way for us to make them smaller, make them more community focused, so then it can be also used for um, others to, to, to the, the survey response, in particular for those who completed the survey. So this is what we, we end up doing both in uh, 2010. And then it, when it came to uh, in 2015, we really wanted to um, try other ways. So this is when we actually published it within some of the, the findings within uh, GCN. So we were for, so then those who were uh, being able to access the magazine were able to also see some of the results of the report. So really geared towards you know understanding what what our community is, what your sexual health is, and and trying to um, to provide some of that information. So again, not just for programmers and researchers, uh, but also to be able to share this information with the community. So it's not that we don't do these full reports anymore. Um, the, the, from the EMIS 2017, there was a specific Irish report as well um, to be able to bring all together all the information that was done with a, a collective of individuals. And, and also a lot of this information ended up being on the research side, being published in academic journal articles as well on specific topics such as, you know, uh, sexually transmitted infections amongst the community and such. Um, but we still really wanted to make sure coinciding with the launch of the report, being able to um, launch some community reports as, as well. So the first of these were published last year at the end of the year, and these were brief four page reports, um, but they were actually published as well in GCN uh, at the end of last year, both in the November and the December issue. So it's been a, we were planning on doing this as well, uh, and for this uh, anniversary, uh, uh, forum as well. So the next two we have now finally been able to publish and really the first two were really looking at the, the, the respondents as a whole. So the first two reports were around the 2000 plus uh, survey respondents. We wanted the next two to be specifically around two specific groups within in, that had taken uh, the, the survey. One was those uh, men living with HIV, which is the, the part three, which I'll share, as well as the report four about men who are born outside of the Republic of Ireland. So we wanted to sort of be able to, you know, highlight the specific information for these specific communities uh, from within the wider report. So these are now been published. Hopefully, if they're not being shared, I'll share them after the presentation, the links to the, to, to the reports. And the first one of these, uh, report three on men living with HIV, will be published in the upcoming issue of GCN if it's not out already. 
So you can download them. They're both four pages long. So I don't want to go into in depth in each, but I do want to give you a bit of a snapshot uh, of what information is in each of the reports. So the first one being um, presenting the findings from 142 uh, men living with HIV. And these were men in, who took the survey who indicated they were diagnosed HIV positive. So this just really helps us to give a picture of um, the gay men and other MSM living in Ireland and living with HIV. So giving some further information. So here, you know, just in general, the ages, where, where, uh, where, where they live, where they were born, and giving this type of information um, to, to, to around the, the reports as well. These are just the general demographics, but importantly, it also asked some specific questions to respondents who had indicated they were living with HIV, uh, including uh, those who are uh, on treatment. So importantly, from this, this information, we note that almost all respondents were currently receiving HIV care with over 90% or 95% percent on treatment and 97 percent reporting suppressed viral load so this is really in line with the higher goals of, of having achieving over 90 uh, percent in each so this is sort of a in, important information that had come out from this report for, uh, from the survey in 2017. it also gave some further insights into the relationships and sex lives of men living with hiv as well as overall sexual health and noting, you know, turning around the numbers that over 70% were happy with their sex lives. So it really gives some information around uh, that and also other um, issues around like around um, STI testing and such as well around other issues around sexual health. And it also goes further into insights around mental health, substance use among men living with HIV. Um, you know, overall, we do note that there's a higher level of recreational substance use, um, you know, 85%, and also higher, similar to what we were seeing in the uh, overall EMIS one, around of, 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 of drug use and substance use amongst the population. Um, but while there was a similar, while there was a higher level of use, there was a similar level of concern where we say that over 13% were worried about their use. But just generally, this sort of gives some of the insights around some of the, 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 the mental health and um, other just general well-being uh, issues. So you can see that within the, the the, the report itself. And you'll see that these can be read, these reports can be read on their own, but they also make links to some of the wider EMIS 2017 report or the, the Irish report as well. The fourth report uh, focused on the 514 men who indicated they were not born in the Republic of Ireland. And this sort of follows previous work from GHN and the Gay Men's Health Service on men from afar, showing the diversity of gay men and other MSM in Ireland. And this is where I previously had been engaged in, in work a number of years ago, you know, as someone who was living in Dublin and was, was born in Canada, sort of just highlighting the different uh, sexual health needs uh, amongst uh, those not born in the Republic of Ireland. So this is also being published for World AIDS Day as well. Um, and it sort of then shows sort of where the diversity of this, you see the countries that people are from, you know, this has changed over the, the last 10 years of, of, the, of the different countries that we now see the highest, such as Brazil. Um, and you also, in this, because the survey was available, the European uh, survey was available in so many in languages, we also got to see what languages were people um, using to complete the survey. You know, while 70% had uh, completed it in, in English, it also showed that there's a large number that were completing the survey in Portuguese. Portuguese, Spanish, Italian, French, and Polish. So it also gives us maybe an indicator for, you know, what languages we should have some of our sexual health information uh, for MSF in Ireland. You know, those that were who didn't indicate they were born in the Republic of Ireland, they were asked other, uh, they were asked similar questions, but they're also asked some specific questions about why did they come here? Uh, how many years have they been living here? And this is where we start noticing some differences between those who were born within the wider, in, within the United Kingdom or the UK and those who are born elsewhere. So you see those not born in the UK are younger, have been here for a less amount of time. And you see a more significant number or a, a higher number that have come here for work purposes, study purposes. And interestingly, you'll see that, um, that a, a number of about 18% indicated they came here to live more openly as gay, bisexual, or trans. Uh, so that was sort of a really interesting finding we're seeing here. 
but we're also seeing that over about over a third um, do of those who were born not in the UK and not in the Republic of Ireland um, that they consider themselves a member or of an ethnic or a racial minority. So again, this has helped to characterize further information uh, amongst those who weren't born in Ireland. It also goes to seeing an STI, and while we noted uh, high levels of self-reported uh, gonorrhea diagnosis, it also just shows in general some or the, some over, overall sexual health and well-being information amongst this. You know, and generally it's it's similar or even higher uh, compared to those who had been who were who specified they were born in Ireland. And we see that also with the knowledge as well. Um, a lot of the a lot of the instances, the knowledge was actually higher amongst those not born in Ireland, uh, or uh, similar or higher, um, in, in, including you know those understanding um, the issues around uh, undetectable means untransmissible, and other uh, issues around access to understanding that what PrEP, and PrEP is used for and those um, who would be interested in, in being able to access PrEP. But obviously noting this survey was done, completed in 2017. And so again, these both of these reports are available online um, and you know we, we would encourage you to review them more in depth. Again, they're very short, so it does give you a nice snapshot of these two populations and to definitely be able to share them more widely uh, as well. But anyways, first, I just want to again thank the many people for supporting the development of these reports. And you know, again, it was really nice to be invited here today and to join the webinar. And I do hope we can all unite in person in the near future. But thank you very much. Daniel, thank you. And, and congratulations on getting some Irish into your last slide as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I won't try to say it. <laughs> So uh, I guess, firstly, this is an opportunity for, I guess, questions uh, from members of the panel. Um, Minister, we've had uh, two comments, one about when will the national health strategy be reviewed and updated? Um, and then secondly, the issue of COVID and I guess travel restrictions in particular, uh, highlighting the need perhaps for greater access to services in rural areas. Uh, so I'm just wondering whether, for instance, you have any sense of when the National Health Strategy will be reviewed? Minister, you're on, you're on mute. Now, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, I'll find that out for you. I'm just, uh, I haven't got that detail to hand. Sure. Um, we're, we are anxious to get all the services up and running again, but uh, I'll find that out for you um, and I'll be back to you. I might have it before the end of the, um, uh, the seminar, okay? Brilliant, thank you. That, and, would, uh, that would be wonderful. Thank you very much. The second question? Uh, that's about how, particularly in the light of COVID, it's, it's, it's kind of highlighted the need for greater access to services in rural areas. Yeah, I, I think a lot of the teams have worked extremely hard and I uh, just want to pay tribute to my team, Department of Health, but all the stakeholders. Uh, we have been anxious to get the, uh, uh, all the networks and supports up and running again. I think um, that is the, that's the priority. Uh, in rural areas, I didn't, didn't know there was a huge issue there, but it's, it's good to know and I will bring that to my department as well. Thank you. Uh, okay. I mean, I, I, I think, you know, there, there has been an issue about rural access for quite a number of years, but with travel restrictions, etc., and the, the kind of restriction on not leaving your county, I guess that has really highlighted uh, that issue or brought it to the fore. Okay. Okay. Thank you uh, again, Minister. Um, uh, so there's a note to everybody to say that all the presentations and videos will be on Gay Health Network. Uh, uh, the, the, our website, so you, you can catch up with that again later. Um, so um, it is now my pleasure to invite Maeve O'Brien to give us a, an update on the uh, Sexual Health and Crisis Pregnancy Programme. Maeve, you're very welcome. Thanks very much. Can you see me, Kieran? Yes, can see yeah, you. Good. Uh, okay, you can see me, you can hear me, good. Yeah, I'm just yeah. going to upload my slides then. Sure. 
I don't see them on the list here. Sorry, I thought that the slides would be um, available. So I just. Um, yeah. Yeah. There we are. Got them? Great. Yeah. OK. Yeah, yeah. So okay, good, yeah. good morning, everybody. And uh, thank you very much to the Gay Health Network for inviting me to contribute this morning uh, to mark this World AIDS Day uh, 2020 and also to mark the, the 25th anniversary of the Gay Health Network. Um, congratulations. Um, so I suppose my input today is about progress relating to the National Sexual Health Strategy, kind of 2015, 2020. And I know that many of you know that, that a lot of work has happened um, over the last number of years in relation to you know, improving you know, sexual health and well-being um, and reducing sexual health risk among the population. Um, but today I'm just going to focus on a, on a few key projects because uh, I can't talk about everything. But um, if anybody has any questions, of course, they can come, come later on. So I suppose I just want to start by kind of just setting the context that we're in. Um, you know, it'll come as no surprise that 2020 has been a really, really challenging year uh, for all of us. Um, and also for us within the program, um, <clears throat> there was, you know, phases of redeployment within our team, which had an impact on our clinical program, our communications program, our education program, our research program. Um, and, you know, not only, was the redeployment a, a, a problem, as you're all aware, in the SHCPP, but redeployment across the system had a, a major impact on HIV and STI testing capacity, with you know most of the testing services closed between March and June, and um, now reopened, but still kind of restricted uh, within the current restrictions. So we're we're really really you know aware of this. Um, and also our colleagues within the Health Protection Surveillance Centre uh, who do such you know, amazing work in, in you know, gathering surveillance data and reporting surveillance data. They also have been impacted by COVID. You know, they, were, they were redeployed, um, which has kind of limited our ability to access kind of up-to-date monitoring and surveillance data, um, you know, which means that we kind of face additional challenges in understanding the current trends around HIV and STIs, um, and also in, in planning our responses for 2021 and, and onwards. But we know that these aren't the only challenges um, that have come through from COVID. Um, I know, Daniel, you, you mentioned earlier, you know, mental health issues being to the fore, and, and we're extremely aware that COVID has created an environment uh, where loneliness and mental health issues are even more to the fore for many people. Um, and, you know, in addition to this, you know, uh, our community HIV testing partners in, in Galway, Limerick, uh, Cork and, and Dublin, you know, have informed us that they're having difficulties in engaging with the hardest to reach populations with their HIV testing, community HIV testing, uh, because of the COVID restrictions. So we, we don't know the full implications yet. Uh, we know that COVID and, um, has had a, has a major impact um, on sexual health and well-being. Um, and it's going to continue to impact for a long time to come. Um, but I suppose, you know, in these circumstances, we just need to strengthen our, our existing kind of partnerships, you know, with our NGOs, sectors, with, you know, other statutory organizations and create new ones. Um, because it's, it's really important that we kind of work together. Um, so that said, you know, despite all of the obstacles, you know, there have been some significant achievements, um, you know, at the end of 2019 and, and now into 2020. So I'll just highlight a few of these. So as the minister mentioned, um, you know, the PrEP programme, you know, is now operating in Ireland, which, which was really significant. I mean, I recall from, from the Gay Health Forum in, in 2019 that one of the key asks from the Gay Health Network at the time was, was the introduction of, of this programme. And in November 2019, um, it was launched, um, making PrEP freely available uh, to clinically el eligible people who are living in Ireland who are at, sub at substantive risk of, of um, HIV. So the program, establishing the program, involves securing annual funding of 5.4 million euros annually 
to fund a range of permanent posts in previously very underfunded STI clinics across the country. I mean, that was really significant, you know, and, and also to fund the medication as well. So the introduction of the PrEP program, I mean, it was led um, really by, by our program by by the clinical desk in our program and i just want to give credit to caroline hurley there uh, who who worked extremely hard um you know last year to implement this um and and also there was there was oversight and from the national working group um and with input from you know our our former clinical lead Professor Fiona Lyons, who put a huge amount of work into it as well, and also our, our NGO stakeholders as well. So uh, PrEP is now available in, in 10 public STI services across the country and in eight private service providers. And currently there are approximately 2,300 individuals registered uh, for PrEP on the system. So while at this stage, we expected to know a little bit more, we expected to be able to have some data at this point, the pandemic has impacted that. It's caused delays in collecting the routine prep data with services, um, but, but now it's underway. And um, you know we're, we're planning to get more detailed data on the impact of prep on HIV and STI acquisition. Um, this will be collected through kind of periodic audit and surveillance over the coming years. So that's definitely a core focus uh, for us. So I'll, I'll just move on to, uh, sorry, my slides aren't moving. Oh yeah, I'll, I'll just move on to um, another project that we, that was delayed, but we managed to push through this year, which is the Sloncha Care Online STI Testing Pilot Project. Um, which we will be launching in early December. Um, so it's it's a pilot service, a pilot STI testing service in Dublin, Cork and Kerry. And we are delivering this in partnership with the STI services in Dublin and Cork and with our NGO partners, uh, HIV Ireland and the Sexual Health Centre in Cork. So this pilot project will assess the feasibility, the acceptability, and the impact of integrating an online STI service into existing public STI services in Ireland. And the sex successful tenderer is the online testing provider, uh, SH24. So during the period of the pilot, uh, people living in the three pilot counties of Dublin, Cork and Kerry will be able to access asymptomatic STI testing through the online platform. Service users will receive a test kit sent to their home with instructions as to how to complete it and how to send it back to the lab. And they will receive their results within 72 hours of the lab having received their samples. And anyone who has a positive result will be referred to one of the participating clinics in, in Dublin and Cork. So the outcomes of, this evalu of the evaluation of this pilot, should it be successful, will be used by us next year to develop a business case and a rationale for scaling this project up nationally. I'm going backwards. Okay. Okay, I just want to move on to the, the HIV stigma campaign, which uh, many of you I'm sure are aware of that we launched earlier this year um, in partnership again with, you know, amazing community work um, and with our sexual health NGO partners. Um, we launched this campaign um, because we wanted to you know, challenge public misconceptions about HIV. The messages of the campaign were that effective treatment allows people living with HIV to remain healthy. It can restore health in those who have become ill with HIV or through HIV, and it prevents HIV from being passed on to, to others. So the campaign posters appeared in uh, transport and social venues and colleges across the country uh, with the tagline, effective treatment means you can't pass HIV onto partners, referencing the global U equals U campaign. So the campaign has continued in the latter half of the year on social media through mantoman.ie and through respectprotect.ie. And next year, an extended campaign for a gay and bisexual and other MSM is planned. It was due to happen this year, but again, COVID hit. <laughs> 
so as well as working um, with with key groups around HIV and STI prevention, I know um, Kieran, you you kind of talked about stigma generally earlier, kind of in relation to you know sexual health, you know, and STIs. I mean, one of the pieces of work that we're also trying to do with the national strategy is you know promoting the sexual health and well-being of the population as a whole. Um, and one aspect to doing this is, you know, developing the ca capacity of parents and carers and professionals to support healthy relationships and sexuality uh, development of children, between, you know, in children, adolescents and young people. So we've recently launched a, a series of booklets um, and they were launched by the minister very kindly um, called Making the Big Talk, Many Small Talks, uh, because we know that what parents and carers do uh, at home matters in this area. Parents can help their children to develop all of the attitudes, values and behaviours necessary for forming and maintaining kind of healthy relationships, including sex healthy sexual health relationships into adulthood. So with regard to the impact of these initiatives on safer sexual practice, we know from the most recent report that we published with the ESRI that was using the National Longitudinal Study growing up in Ireland using this data. We know from this data that parent-child communication about relationships and sexual health in the early years has a protective influence on young people as they reach sexual debut and they become sexually active. So at present, we have booklets for parents of children of four to seven-year-olds, of eight to 12-year-olds, as well as having a brochure detailing a range of books that we've made available in 330 libraries across the country. And next year, we plan to develop a book for uh, parents of teenagers, and we're also to planning some, you know, larger scale promotional activities around this, this work. Um, and I'll just move on to, uh, you know, moving on to, you know, the importance of research and evidence informed practice. Um, you know, I was really, really delighted to listen to, to Mick and Daniel earlier, you know, presenting on, you know, EMAS 2017 community reports. Uh, we worked closely with the Gay Health Network and with the Health Protection Surveillance Centre in 2018 and 2019 to uh, publish the EMAS 2017 Ireland report. The data set, which you're all aware of, was, was collected and coordinated by Sigma Research in the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Um, but it's provided some really, really important findings about the, the lives of, of gay and bisexual men, you know, living here and living in other countries. But this is an example where an existing data set can be kind of further interrogated and used, you know, and the results disseminated widely to inform attitudes, decision making, policy and practice. So it's really great to see Daniel and, and Mick using it in this way and, and kind of promoting the, the data further. Um, and also, it's also great to see, um, I know for the kind of the communications planning around man to man, you know, that EMAS 2017 and, and other significant pieces of research are kind of informing the, the kind of communications decision making there. Um, in relation to kind of our wider research program, just to, you know, let you know that we're currently completing our scoping study uh, to inform uh, a nationally representative survey of the general population next year. So the, the survey is going to be gathering data on, you know, sexual health uh, and well-being and crisis pregnancy. And it's going to be a very, very significant study um, of the entire population that will be able to kind of measure changes over time, um, but also, you know, take into account some of the really significant developments over the past 10 years when the last, you know, since the last study was, was carried out. Um, okay, I think that's probably it. Um, I know, you know, the minister, we were talking there about the next strategy. Um, I, I think that that was possibly delayed again due to COVID, but I know that there is kind of a commitment there from the Department of Health um, to, to initiate that work um, as soon as possible. Uh, but in the meantime, you know, we, we have a lot of work to continue on, you know, within the current strategy. Um, we have developed, you know, an operational plan, a busy operational plan for next year. Um, so before I pass back over to Kieran, just want to say big congratulations to the Gay Health Network. Um, for this important event. Thank you very, very much for inviting me to contribute. And here's to building a brighter future together for everybody's sexual health and well-being. Thanks. 
Thank you so much, Maeve. Um, I would like to firstly say that for the us at Gay Health Network, it is a pleasure to be working with Sexual Health Crisis Pregnancy Agency because, because over the years, it has increasingly felt that it's a sense of partnership as opposed to any kind of tokenistic response, you know, from a public sector organization to an NGO. So we really value our working relationship with you and, and Anita and Caroline and your other colleagues. And, and so it is my absolute fervent hope that that continues to grow and develop and that together uh, as both a network and, and indeed with other NGO and, and public sector providers that we increasingly collaborate to bring about a more comprehensive and more accessible uh, sexual health uh, service, uh, both in terms of service delivery, but also information and, and health promotion, sexual health promotion. Uh, to, to the population in Ireland, so thank you. If I could make one plea, and this is a shameless declaration of my day job, because I work at Age and Opportunity, um, I think we also do need to start addressing sexual health among older persons, because increasingly in Ireland, older persons are, are often uh, having either second relationships or indeed multiple relationships in, in older age. And I would suggest, or at least I suspect, that many of us don't regard older persons as being at risk of, of STIs in general. Um, so we could probably do with, with some kind of, I guess, awareness raising of the issue, uh, because certainly I know uh, that you know ageism is is pretty prevalent and so we're often assumed to be non-sexual probably when we hit around 50 you know and uh, uh, so and, and that's across the board that's not just you know uh, people like that's not just men who have sex with men but um, uh, all people that it's kind of like there's an assumption that your sexual drive probably drops or ends probably in fact even in your 40s you know so um so i think we do need to do something to encourage greater sexual health among older people um and i'm i really you know been so delighted at the 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 commitment to to continue funding uh prep for people and i guess there is still may well be an issue around uh migrants having access to prep and that's something that we would like to collaborate with you on as well. I know, I know that HIV Ireland has been doing some work on that, that area as well. So so thank you. Folks. Um, Hold on, Kieran. the minister wants to get in there. Yeah, okay, sorry, I didn't see that. Thank you, Mick. Minister. Yeah, uh, thanks. Just uh, Maeve has outlined for the National Sexual Health Strategy that is being uh, postponed because of COVID, but it's likely now the review will take place in 2021. Also regarding the GHN, um, a memorandum of agreement has been made with the Guy Clinic in James's Hospital to provide services uh, uh, for the GHN until services of the gay community return to normal provision. So there is a memorandum of, of, of agreement already, but we, we want to get that uh, sorted out as soon as possible. Thank you, Minister. So that, that's thank the you. gay men's health service. You were yes. Referring to. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, folks. Just quickly on, on that, because there's word coming in that there's not enough capacity in the clinics to take on the needs of the men who used to attend the Gay Men's Health Service. And there's a petition has started, so there is a big concern that the needs are not being met, even though, because the other clinics can't take on the, the hundreds and thousands of men who attended the Gay Men's Health Service. Okay, well, if it's possible, if you want to, uh, I will raise that. Um, uh, on Monday, um, just and we'll, we'll see what we can do. Okay, okay. thanks, thanks. Brilliant. Yeah, thank you very much, Minister. Folks, I'd like to propose a 10 minute break. Uh, so we have Mick, uh, who needs no introduction to anybody, uh, but we also have Noel Sweeney. And again, Noel will be familiar to many people uh, through his work with Ponybox. Uh, he's uh, an internationally acclaimed artist and designer and also a long time collaborator with the Gay Health Network. Um, we also then have uh, Porik, who is communications director with the network and uh, Porik brings over 20 years experience from the broadcasting arts and charity sectors. So uh, over to you guys.
and, and Peter. <laughs> um, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Um, I'm delighted to be able to present this. I presented it actually last year in DCU, um, um, and it's a long 25 years, um, but it's also a long 25 year celebration. And today is kind of to end our celebration part and to continue with the future. So it's worth putting in some context, and this is what this is about. So it's, I dedicate this to, to Noel Walsh and to Dr. Newell Kine and to Tom McGinty, ACT UP. Um, I don't know how many people will remember the Dublin Lesbian and Gay Men's Collective and, um, in the early 80s. And then we produced this book in 1985 and it had sections in it on AIDS. But people might remember that when AIDS was first called Gay Related Immune Deficiency, and the New York Times in May 11, 1982 had a whole thing on it. So it was, we were starting all, we already had stigma and then we were starting all with delayed more because how, how can a disease be called after the sexuality? Anyway, but the biggest thing that changed took place when uh, Rock Hudson died. If people at the time remember, it became more prominent and more people started more talking about it, even the place where I trained in uh, the gym in uh, Henry Street. And then in 1985, Dublin Lesbian Gay Collectives and Corp and all, we helped set up the Gay Health Action in 1985 and it continued till 1990. It was a community response to AIDS, which was led worldwide again by lessons of gay men to its different groups. And Ireland's response before AIDS was certified in the country. Um, and then there was the, the Lesbian and Gay, Lesbian Gay Health Action, Lesbian Health, or sorry, Gay Health Action, Lesbian Health Action, the Irish community, gay community was organised on the AIDS issue before it was confirmed with the Irish president of the country, and we had done a very few things. So here's some samples. The first, the first uh, AIDS leaflet in 1985 and the second one in 1986. But we have to remember where we're starting with that, the whole fear around STIs and sex and the control of sex that leads to prejudice, ignorance, fear and blame. So look at these posters around VD and sex, so we can see how discriminatory they are and how wild. So that's what we're, we're leading against. And then of course, what we looked at was fighting back by eroticizing safer sex. I think this was a first in Ireland and a first in the world, the gay men's health crisis in New York led on it. And the cheek of us to be doing things like this. So the gay men's health crisis in New York, the, the safer sex comic, the seventh one, it was produced in 1987. And then uh, Gay Health Action's first play safe, car, play safe Play Sexy card. And it was fairly funny because you had to different risk, risk. And I remember because we had water sports in it and people were asking us, was that skiing uh, in Dublin? And then we had the Gay Health uh, Sex Leaf at the Blue One in 1989. And then less than the Gay Health Caucus, we sat with Nizzy in uh, Dublin, uh, uh, Dublin AIDS Alliance at the time. We, we done this with the US uh, Union Students of Ireland and all local models, if I should say so myself, uh, were involved in it. So this was another first. But the Gay Men's Health Service then was set up in 1992. So it's older than the Gay Health Network and vital for community action and vitally involved in the community with GHN, Johnny, Personal Development Courses, workshops on eroticizing cyber sex and research. So just before I head off, uh, the signed the petition is on now on the GCN. If people click on it, they, they'll be able to sign the petition to get it reopened. The game has helped uh, GMHP and Cork Ace Alliance done this man-to-man -man in 1992. And then of course it's decriminalization in uh, 1993. Gay Health Network was set up in 1994 to provide a forum. And this was the first book in 1995, 1995, Healthy, Hot and Horny. And it was information to give you the power to determine the risk you want to take and the virtue of all the pleasures of relationships, sex and intimacy. So this is some of the, the uh, content. And one important thing in it was to fight AIDS, not people with AIDS, and to fight stigma. Thank you. Thanks, Mick.
So we move on to, to Parik, is it now, Parik? No, it's Niall Sweeney. Niall, it's me. Okay, cool. Sorry, I should have had it off to you, Niall. <laughs> so as I say, for... <laughs> that's fine. That's, it's amazing, actually, just, just quickly, how some of that really old stuff still just still stands up and is just still perfectly relevant, you know, uh, today, you know, of course, it's, it's, uh, it's very interesting just looking back at some of the, what seems like another era, you know. So I just, so I just um, go for it? Yeah. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so uh, hello, everyone. I am honored to have been asked to briefly present a bit of my story in all of this today. And uh, not only in celebrating Gay Health Network's 25 years, but also in marking World AIDS Day and remembering Noel Walsh. It has to be said that the work you do has been instrumental in my own survival, as well as so many of my friends, loved ones and colleagues. So I salute you and I thank you for that. I can only speak here from my own personal and professional point of view <coughs> and only about any of the design work that we did with GHN, which was during its early years in the mid 90s. But I also speak on behalf of the great Alternative Miss Ireland family and how the arc of our own story of collective discovery <laughs> ran in parallel and intertwined with that of the formative years of Gay Health Network, with local and global queer liberation, the arrival of HIV and AIDS, and the drive for social, cultural and political change. My mother always told me <coughs> to be modern and then to do good work with as much emphasis on the doing good as the doing work. She was an environmental activist throughout her life and she would go on to be co-founder and then president of the European Environmental Bureau for 10 years. So ideas of how your life and your work, your very existence, can combine to create positive change has always been in my blood. We started Alternative Miss Ireland in 1987 when I was just 20 years old, the same year that I had worked as a designer at the original Gay Community News in Boston, alongside some great activist thinkers and protagonists there. And now I was finding myself in an Ireland before decriminalization <clears throat> and yet already in the throes of the AIDS crisis. Yet it wasn't until the 90s that things really started to get going. Alternative Miss Ireland and the many pan-gender polysexual clubs and events that we staged in Ireland kicked off with gusto in the mid 90s, continuing well into the 2000s and continue to form the core ideas of thought and process through all of the work I do here, locally and globally. It has to, it has to be said, to be honest, that one of the driving reasons for starting so many of the clubs was sexual we were young and hungry for the world, and uh, we also knew that sexuality and sex were revolutionary actions in themselves, as well as being great fun and a celebration of life. Dressing up and having fun was, and still is, a political act. So in the 90s, HIV AIDS was already a core part of our agenda. We had all been away discovering the world and the exciting and creative sexual joy that it offers joy that also now came with a specific threat. So when it came to work at my studio in Dublin, the events that we would create and run, ideas around the promotion of sexual health and HIV AIDS education and activism were naturally part of that, as quite literally our very lives depended on it, regardless how, of how any of us identified as we ran around under our manifesto of a united future gender agenda. The handing out of flyers was a key part of the mechanism of promotion and communication at the time, something that we invested a lot into <coughs> and went all out on. And working with GHN in its early years, we were able to integrate into that mechanism the pioneering work of Gay Health Network. And in turn, the design work that Ed Shipsey and myself produced in the mid 90s for GHN also became part of our broader agenda just as my mother had taught me, the design work we did, the creative endeavor that we brought to the GHN stage had to be good. It had to be the best with currency and no compromises. It is fundamental that the visualization of information and messaging is as good as the message itself. 
they should and must be part of the same thing in order for them to succeed, to have relevance and to engage their audience. Together, they are greater than the sum of their parts. But like any great club flyer, <clears throat> they, are all, they are also a call to action at the moment that it counts. And the strength of the design becomes an expression of the strength of the message. And on top of this, of course, life was literally at stake here. So it was imperative that both message and design were as good as can be. The rubber up wallets that we designed with GHN and the flyers and cards and booklets for Play Safe, Play Sexy with their celebratory sexual imagery and upfront no holds barred language were all worked on with the same design approach that we had with all of our work especially the clubs. And this meant that they felt like they were coming from the inside, from knowledgeable and activated comrades, rather than a government directive, which I feel was right for the time. So I think this helped people in taking on the information, of feeling like they could trust this information, that just as they were, it was part of the forward movement of the community to carry and use this sexy information the free condoms and lube in their shiny metallic wallet adorned with body fluids looked exactly like many of the club flyers and posters that we were making. We designed them to vibrate with the time with their audience, which included ourselves. They also pushed boundaries, <clears throat> which is another key factor. They pushed the boundaries of both the community they spoke to as well as the world around. Pushing boundaries is how you build the future. Over 25 years, Alternative Miss Ireland grew into a hugely significant annual moment in the queer calendar, not only to joyfully celebrate ourselves for ourselves, but also in its dedication to the promotion, fundraising and growth of HIV AIDS organisations and information in Ireland. And GHN was a constant and significant collaborator with AMI throughout her glorious life. Times are indeed different now, <laughs> this year particularly, and the social, cultural, political, and sexual landscapes have changed, together with the mechanisms of the delivery and distribution of information. And yet the principles have not. Just as we at Alternative Miss Ireland had built our own stage to dance upon because we knew that no one else was going to do it for us, it is the same principle with sexual health. At the moment that it actually counts, no one else is going to do it for you. So for me, the mission is to enable folks to build their own sexual stage to dance upon, equipped with uncompromised and well-designed knowledge, a call to action at the moment of the action itself. It will always be a challenge for GHN and the spectrum of other organizations represented here today large and small, national and local, to deliver their message with currency and authority, with joy and without compromise. And I have to say it's a challenge that you are all constantly and amazingly rising to. So happy Silver Jubilee, Gay Health Network, 25 years. You were the same age as Alternative Miss Ireland as when she retired almost nine years ago. And though retirement is something that is definitely not on your agenda right now, you can build upon such an incredible past as you now break ground for the future. Thank you. Thanks a million, Niall, for those words. Um, I have to say, uh, by coincidence, as, a, 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 as somebody who was an outreach worker in uh, the Gay Health Network in the late 1990s, uh, I was patrolling Galway, Mayo and Roscommon with those rubber up condom packs. <laughs> to, go from, to go from handwritten safer sex messages, which is what we went from distributing to those packs overnight, really increased the cred uh, design-wise. So it was an, I, I have such fond memories of those packs. And um, the Gay Health Network are really uh, grateful for your work and also your, your, your kind articulation of the affirmation of the network's work, which you've uh, talked this tree today, so thank you, Noel. Um, I think it's on to Mick again. And I just want to add because um, uh, we misunderstood each other because I would have included on my slides that, uh, and if you watch out for the in the video, the second place I play sex that was just healthy, hot, and horny, but the first place I play sexy was by Noel and Ed Shipsy. It's the black and white one CD cover, 
the, on the thing, but you see it in the video. So if you bear with me now, I'll just start this. Uh, I don't think possibly now more than ever we need, need the alternative Miss Ireland right now. I know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> we had to leave her be for a while because, you know, but. Here we go. Can you see it? Yep. Yeah. So. Um, so you can see the 25 years of, um, of um, leaflets and all that from the Gale Network. And here's from the 2010-11 man-to-man programme. HIV infection is increasing in Ireland. Let's value our sexual health and protect each other when having sex. You are. He is. We are worth protecting. And um, so we're proud of that, but also we've done that in a couple of languages and the same as our latest leaflets are all in about four or five languages. The one thing about the network and working is trying to get stuff together. And this is one a homemade uh, video. So thank you. Oh. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. And now I believe, we, thanks Mick for that. I believe we do move on to Porrick now, yeah? Yeah, I'm trying to just, can you see me? Oh yeah, oh yeah, here I am. Okay, um, share screen. Sorry, it's my first time doing this um, PowerPoint. Is that coming? Okay, there it is. Um, so yes, hi, I'm the communications director with Gay Health Network. I started the job um, in June in the middle of the pandemic. Um, my background wasn't sexual health, so there was a lot to learn. And luckily there was a great bunch of people at GHN on the board and, um, and our partners, stakeholders. Um, we're primarily funded by the HSE and sexualwellbeing.ie, um, the 
crisis, uh, sexual health and crisis pregnancy program. And the support that has been given to me since I've been there has been incredible from Anita, from Evine, from Caroline, and um, from Maeve as well. So it has, like, the, starting off, I suppose the first thing we looked at was the COVID and um, guidelines and getting all that out of the way. And I kind of learned very quickly how important it was that, you know, language and everything we say, and just because we're dealing with, like, the HSC and the national, um, it, it's like the, the government body. So it's just so important because, yeah. Okay, so the, the, the messaging that comes from... Um, uh, the man to man and the GHN. Um, Excuse me, could I just point out, we've had a message to say that the spotlight is still on Mick and David and it should be on you now. Okay. And you you look after the spotlighting, don't you? Remove spotlight, sorry. Yeah. Okay. Can you... Okay, is that better? Yeah. Okay. Um, so hang on. You have to go back on your... Okay, so yes, yeah, so the messaging that we, you know, we need to reach our audiences, so, that, so they need to be realistic, inclusive, and sex positive, um, human rights based, uh, thought provoking, um, harm reduction, evidence based, so using MS and other findings and the surveys we do each year with the HSE, they have to be non fear based um, and they can be suggestive and humorous when appropriate. Um, there's just there's a lot to consider. Um, and I think the, the work obviously that has been done for the last 25 years has been incredible. And I suppose there's just so many, there's more, so many more channels now. And I suppose we have more partners and there's a lot to consider. So it's very important that. Um, we all work together to get the right message and that as many people sort of are across what we're trying to say um, so that we don't say the wrong thing. And I mean, this list as well, I think it's something we can revisit and look at and, and add to as we grow and learn because it's constantly learning with this role. So here's a look at how at the moment we're connecting um, and how we reach our audiences. So we have the, the Man to Man website. Um, we use uh, we're, we, at the moment, we have partnerships with hookup sites with like Scruff uh, and um, Grinder, which is great because we're getting directly to those people using the phone and those people who are having sex with our safe sex messaging. Um, Facebook and Instagram are great for retargeting certain types of people. So people who are like 18 to 24, like recently I targeted them with information on chlamydia or on STIs. And like, uh, you know, if, depending on how much money you put in, you can um, get many many thousands of views while facebook is flawed it's good for that in a sense and we've just set up a spotify account as well hopefully be able to do something with that and then we have posters digital ads we've ads in gc and magazine gays film festival and also sort of going to look for new ways of connecting so tiktok has come up i think it's a great way to connect to 18 to 25 year olds especially with issues you know the uh, findings that um they mightn't have a knowledge or awareness of uh, HIV and testing at the moment and so we need to to look at that and try and reach them and that's one way I mean another way would be snapchat as well and again targeting on the social media so here like the, the sort of stuff we do is like prevention is one of the first things so we can let people know like yes you can use a condom please here's prep try and get on prep or look if you have had sex without a condom and you're not on prep then um, there's pep so we want to spread the sort of message that they look, there's a variety of things, almost like a menu of things that you can do to stay safe and prevent the spread of STIs and HIV. And again, um, here, and also give information about testing. So at the moment, because of COVID, like we're sort of saying, look, you can get tested, things aren't up and running and the GMH, GM, GMHS is closed. But if, if you have a symptom, you should get checked out. And then the Get Your Bits Out for the Lab came out last year. Um, and it's a really great ad. Um, again, we kind of, during the summer, we couldn't put out ads like that because of COVID. But I think we can, you know, again, the message is to yeah, get tested if you can. And again, here, look, barebacking. Some people do it. And our message is kind of positive as well, saying, look, if you bareback, you know, enjoy it, but also get tested regularly, regularly if you do that. And again, uh, Maeve mentioned this earlier as well. I think it's a lovely campaign, the U equals U, and it's something we're going to build upon this year. I mean, this was designed now with the HSE 
um, uh, we're behind this, I think, Caroline, and we're going to work together in the new year to see what else we can do. And I think a lot of this will be storytelling and involving people. And I know I spoke to Susan before, and she's saying it's hard to get people to talk, you know, who, who have HIV. And I think we need to try and reach these people and tell their stories to help them and other people who are being newly diagnosed and also who are living with HIV. And I think we can do that. Um, so, and again, like drink and drugs at the moment, I'm trying to to work on messaging for drink and drugs and alcohol for Christmas. And I've been in touch with drugs.ie and I've been talking to even at HSE. And it's actually very difficult at the moment because there's things you can't show and there's there's language and things you can't use. Um, and because it's COVID, we can't really show people together. We can't say, have a nice party or you know enjoy yourself. So there's a lot to consider and we haven't got there. We've been brainstorming this for a couple of weeks. Um, so hopefully that's just one issue that we're, we're trying to address at the moment. And just it's complex getting it right and getting the right tone. Um, here's a look, uh, we have a new partnership with Grindr and over the last four months we've had different ads and they appear once a month and it is a great way of connecting directly with our audience who are actually having sex. Um, uh, we got, yeah, we hope to continue that partnership with the man to man in the, or with uh, Grindr in the new year. So like starting the job, like here's the definition of sexual health from the World Health Organization. I just read the red, it's a state of physical, emotional, mental and social well-being in relation to sexual, sorry, this sexual sexuality. It is not merely the absence of disease, dysfunction or infirmity. And that really hit me. And I think it's so true. Uh, even when I spoke at the interview for the job, I mean, one of the first things I brought up was, um, oh, sorry. Um, mental health. So the sort of looking ahead at, at 2021, I mean, we will continue to look at um, messaging around prevention, creating awareness of HTI and targeting people, you know, like whether you're 18 to 24 or again, like Kieran mentioned earlier, mentioned later, we can target people who are older as well, once we have the right content and the right message to, to say to them. And I think that's very, very important. So, but mental health is the top of everyone's list and it's something we're creating at the moment, pages for the man-to-man -man website. Um, we're in touch with the HSE on that and I've been in touch with AWARE because we just, yeah, I think it connects to everything, you know, our sexual health or mental health, it's all interrelated. And I like as well, Maeve mentioned earlier about education when you're younger. And I think it's so important because I think a lot of the mental health issues that can arise with um, GBSM men, like they, they stem from, growing up in a society really well previously anyway where where being homosexual was was kind of stigmatized and again mental health can be connected with drugs and alcohol we want to look more closely at that um and just all these subject areas are huge and broad um so it's trying to find exactly how the right way to do them so again consent is another thing that's come up i think like we're getting contacted um at a man to man just by young people in college asking about why is there no not a lot of information and I think it's something that we can look at and explore um, going forward and um, I've been in touch with the Dublin Rape Crisis Centre and they're really keen to work with us on that so again and diversity include diversity and inclusion and um, we've just been given funding by the Department of Justice LGBT fund uh, we applied for money to get imagery and people and involve just have a range of diversity in all our um, output so that nobody feels excluded. So that is great that we have that. And so keep an eye out for that in the coming year. And again, the U equals UHIV stigma, that is something we will work, we've been working on with the HSE in the new year and planning how best to do that. And again, I said like storytelling and people uh, videos. So uh, I'll be finishing up now, collaboration never goes out of style. So looking at the Gay Health Network and all the different um, organizations involved, I've been, looking at your work over the last six months and it's just absolutely incredible what you're doing how you're connecting how you're coming up with new initiatives new ideas um uh, you know on mental health or on consent or on you know, like screen age kicks um and it's I, I my intention is to try and work with you um you know if we were to say reach 18 to 24 year olds on issues of HIV then I could imagine we could work with HIV Ireland and belong to because they would be just perfect partners for that if we were looking at mental health and LGBT Ireland or perhaps GOSH would be people to work with. Um, I think it's important that we work together and I would be keen to do more of that in the new year uh, and also beyond the network and um, just with other people as well I mean this list isn't exhaustive I think there's just no end 
to the amount of people we could work with just to improve our service and make sure our messaging is correct and reach people and the hard to reach people. Thank you. Laura, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for that presentation and uh, to Nick and Niall. Porik, uh, it's really good to get a sense of the underlying strategy uh, behind the communications of the Gay Health Network. Uh, so thank you for that. And again, thanks to, to Mick and Porik. So thematically, I think we've come to the end of this session. Um, David. We're going to move on now. Uh, hello. David, sorry, there's, there's been a, a, in the chat, somebody has asked, is there a hashtag for, for, the, for, the, uh, for, for what's happening now? Is there a Twitter tag? Because oh, I, I said, I'll, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll send it on. Perfect. Thank you. Or you're, you're multitasking here. <laughs> um, okay. And I see, uh, Minister, you're very welcome back. We're really thrilled you could have joined us uh, for the second half of this session uh, to mark the 25th anniversary of the Gay Health Network. And we're hearing from a range of different stakeholders and supporters of the network uh, at the moment uh, about different aspects of sexual health in relation to men who have sex with men. But uh, as far as I know, we're moving on thematically now. Uh, I mentioned um, our next speaker is Harry McAnulty. And Harry will be familiar to many of you as a member of the Gay Health Network back in the noughties. And then Harry moved to the UK where he worked in the area of sexual health for a number of years before eventually moving to Australia where he set up Harry McAnulty Consultancy, which specialized in support around a whole uh, suite of social justice issues, including uh, youth, asylum seekers, refugees, and of particular relevance to this conference, LGBTI. So I think, Harry, you're going to talk about aspects of networking, and you're very welcome. Then, look, thanks very much. And as Daniel said earlier, I think it's really great um, to be part of the virtual sort of network and seeing all the familiar faces. Um, it was quite scary when um, you mentioned that I, it was 2007, which is 13 years ago, that I was a member of the Gay Health Network. So that made me feel really old. And I think I've lost my baby gay status now. So <laughs> I did feel slightly old when that was mentioned. And when I spoke to Mick uh, earlier, um, he did, he wanted me to chat a little bit um, about, about networking and the power of networking. And I think back in 2007, it was really important at that point um, that we had an all Ireland collaboration in terms of um, when I worked at the Rainbow Project and um, looking at HIV and, and transmission of STIs and working together collaboratively and, um, you know, it, from the six counties in the North and in the Republic, they actually respond to what was going on for men at that time. So the network played um, a pivotal uh, role um, in terms of allowing me to develop um, the brand and, and the messaging that we sent out at that time in the early days um, of me working um, in, at the Rainbow Project. I suppose since then, as you mentioned, I did go and work in the UK, but then for a number of years in Australia, probably um, for about four or five, I worked in the HIV response there. And today I'm going to talk a little bit about natural networks and the impact from an Australian perspective and the impact that they can have in terms of influence in government policy, but also shaping the response um, to HIV. So I might start off there talking a little bit um, about um, that natural network. So as I mentioned, I was working within the Victorian AIDS Council, which is a HIV charity that's based um, in metropolitan Melbourne. And that um, organization um, offers a suite of services around HIV um, support, um, but also in terms of preventing um, HIV. And it was during the time, um, and I, I forget the date, I think it was maybe 2013 or 14, when the PROUD study in um, the UK was stopped because of the ethical reasons around um, having um, gay men on a placebo and because of the efficacy of the drug, they actually stopped the trial and started giving everyone PrEP. And this news obviously seeped around the world. And at that point, um, Australia had no access to PrEP. So there was literally a group 
um, of um, gay men. There was positive gay men, there was negative gay men. And the group came together and formed, formed a bit of a network, I suppose, um, and started to think creatively around how they could actually get um, PrEP into the hands of people who were at risk um, in the country. So that informal network actually grew um, to what's known now as PrEP Access Now, which is a formal organization um, that actually supports the implementation of PrEP in Australia. But that organization worked with the peak body organizations. They worked with all the different charities. And initially what people were doing were actually gathering up their, their HIV positive friends, drugs, and they were dishing them out to people who actually needed them. Whether that's right or wrong, it's probably going back to the, the Dallas Fire Club days, but um, that's, that's what, what people were doing initially to get access to PrEP and also access and PEP to use as PrEP. So that what was what, what was happening. That information from that group um, of gay and bisexual men um, really fed in to the organizations and allowed the organizations then to collaborate with clinicians and collaborate with government. So at that point, it was really important that that grassroots network was able to feed a lot of that information through and really informed the picture of how PrEP and was really implemented within the Australian context. So um, a lot of the studies then um, started popping up with researchers and with the support of government. And then in different states, PrEP was implemented differently. So I just wanted to talk just that, just one little example um, of how networks are really important and particularly those peer-based networks that are on the ground um, and engaging. And I see um, through the Gay Health Network and the organizations that are involved in it and um, the power of those peer networks and how they can influence and, and really shape um, the direction of how we respond uh, to HIV. So I just quickly, because as um, David mentioned, I have set up a consultancy business and I work both um, on projects now in Australia and um, in Ireland. Um, and it's been a few years since I've, I've been working in HIV, but I did look up the Australian um, HIV rates and um, for the first time in five years, there was a 25 or 30% drop um, in the rates amongst gay and bisexual men. And that wasn't just related to PrEP, but also related to uh, treatment as prevention and the U equals U campaign um, and things like that. But obviously PrEP has pre played a crucial role Interestingly, within the Australian context, the, that, incre that incre or, sorry, um, percentage decrease in incidences um, wasn't reflected within the heterosexual community. So it does show that the response in terms of um, responding to the epidemic around gay and bisexual men with treatment as prevention and PrEP and all the different activist groups that were involved in the networks and collaborations actually were really um, impactful and powerful. The good thing within that context in Australia, um, depending on, on where you are and what state you're in, I was lucky to be in a state that was uh, really good in terms of responding to HIV from a government perspective. And um, so they were able to fund um, all the different projects and approaches, which was um, really good at the time. Um, and I might just uh, finish off by saying that um, I noticed that um, Podrick had a bit of it's a bit of um, text on his last side, and it was something about collaboration doesn't go out of fashion. And I think you know that's that's really important to remember that 25 years on, as the Gay Health Network started out as a collaboration, and I think the Rainbow Project were um, back in the day one of those people that were around the table. I think it's it's amazing that there's opportunities um, for organisations to collaborate particularly in, in relation to HIV and STIs and gay, bisexual and trans men. So I might just leave that there. And um, if anyone has any questions at the end, I'm happy to ask them or um, get in touch with people through email or whatever it might be. Thank you. And thank you so much for that, Harry. Uh, some 
really useful reflections there on your experience of networking. And, and we will hopefully have some time, I think, here on for questions at the end, but with a little bit of time pressure, we're under a little bit of time pressure now, so we'll move on if that's okay. But again, thank you, Harry. Uh, our next speaker, uh, as I mentioned earlier, is Peter Kyo. Uh, again, familiar to many of you, uh, Peter is a senior lecturer in public health at the Open University, and he has over 30 years experience of community-based research in areas of HIV, AIDS, sexual health and LGBTI communities in particular and over the years has partnered uh, working with Sigma Research and the Gay Health Network on many different aspects of research and I think uh, Peter is going to talk to us uh, again on uh, uh, an idea around networking. I can't actually even see you Peter at the moment, apologies. Kathmir, hello, can, can everyone hear me okay? Yeah. Brilliant yeah. and can you see uh, slides there? Yeah. Yeah, you can. excellent. I, I, you, you never know what um what things are going to look like to you as a speaker when you when you yeah. use Zoom. Um, thanks very much for inviting me to to speak at today's at, at today's event, and I'm really delighted to be here. Um, and it brings back many happy memories of past collaborations and indeed um um uh, great events generally in 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 Dublin Castle, but actually um also um. The events that were after the events which were generally much more fun as well and unfortunately life has become very dull we we, we, we no longer have these opportunities to um to, to, to mash up a bit so I, I wanted to talk to you and it's actually really fortuitous and i'm going to try and dash through it um for to try and save some time um it's a it's a fortuitous theme that seems to have emerged out of this afternoon session which is about networks and networking uh, because that's precisely what I want to talk to you about today. And I want to talk to you about uh, a tiny initiative that a bunch of us got involved in, in response to a research call, which was the, from the Irish Research Council and the uh, Economic and Social Research Council here in the UK, which was about building um, UK Ireland networks. And that was within the context of the big B word Brexit and um, how basically, uh, not to put too fine a point in it, um, things were getting messy around here. I'm sorry, I'm based in the UK, and we were going to have to uh, start start reaching out to our closest neighbours. So um, I want to talk to you, we didn't get funded, but actually a lot of the ideas for the network, um, I think are good ideas and had a good amount of currency. So I want to talk to you about them today. Um, is that moving on to the next slide? It is, okay. Yeah, Peter, do you want to go into slideshow for? Yeah, I certainly will. Yeah. Uh, from the beginning. There you go. Yeah, that's better, isn't it? Yeah. Lovely. Um, now, this was an academic kind of community collaboration. We at the, I work for the Open University, and we at the Open University were uh, the kind of co lead with Trinity College, um, with the School of Nursing at Trinity College, Dublin. Um, with Agnes and Brian there. And we also had researchers from the University of Glasgow, Edinburgh, Queens, and Ulster. We were lacking a Welsh partner, but we had um, certainly Northern Ireland, England, uh, Republic of Ireland, and Scotland engaged there. And we also had um, community partners, which was belong to the National Women's Council, um, Alliance for Choice, as well in Northern Ireland, and Waverley Care. And the idea was what we wanted to do was to set up a um, digital uh, knowledge network, um, a sexual and reproductive health digital knowledge network across what we've called the Anglo-Celtic Isles. Uh, we, we, we're trying to avoid these kind of language of British Isles or um, um, actual uh, specific countries. So why was it going to be, or why should it be a transnational network? Well. There's uh, a lot of reasons for that. And I think we've talked about a lot of them today. Ireland, um, the Republic certainly has always been very outward looking and has had um, long um, historical relationships with its nearest neighbors that have shaped its sexual and reproductive health response profoundly. This picture here refers of course to the Irish abortion corridor, um, which was, you know, um, um, established very, very strong links between Ireland, Wales, and England. 
We also had wonderful um, historical kind of movements, which were around using the border to show how um, sexual and reproductive health was not equal across these islands. They, this is the uh, Condon train arriving, I think, at, uh, at Connolly Station from Belfast sometime in the 1970s. Um, and uh, I, I, I wouldn't profess to remember, of course, this is, this is way, way, way. Um, but also, of course, we've just been talking about it today in terms of the kind of Irish gay diaspora and the Irish gay diasporic response. Um, you know, there have been huge coalitions in terms of research, knowledge production, uh, the kind of media production, the kind of know-how and knowledge with um, Irish gay people or Irish LGBT people in England and Wales and Scotland in the United States. And so um, this kind of transnational, trans-border um, trans aspect of Ireland's response, I think, is, is, is pretty key. But also there's Brexit, and that is bringing huge problems, I mean, not, won't mince words, to um, what, what I would say is kind of formally the UK. We don't really talk, trying not to talk about the UK anymore because it, it feels like a very problematic notion. Uh, devolution and independence are on the agenda within Scotland and Wales, um, surprisingly Wales. Tensions have never been so high between England and Ireland. Uh, the status of Northern Ireland, both kind of positively and negatively, is, is really in question more and more. And I think that we recognise that, that really is an, a time for like uh, minority communities, LGBT communities, sexual minorities, feminist networks, to really try and formalize the networks that we hold because we're being kind of torn apart uh, by, 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 by nationalisms. So why a digital network? Well, the most obvious response to that is uh, we have been having to communicate digitally since the spring. Um, this is, a necessity, this, is, this is an absolute necessity, but as you can see today, it's actually a huge opportunity. What a lot of people have been finding is that, that the necessity to be online has really opened up spaces. It's really broken down the kind of urban, rural, the metropolitan, rural divides. Um, and increasingly it's forcing us to challenge the digital divide um, to try and get more and more people online. And actually that's a major opportunity in terms of allowing us to, um, to really increase the participation in, in, in civil life and to participate from anywhere. I don't know whether you guys have noticed it, but you suddenly find Zoom conferences are being attended, like Irish ones. I was at one recently, it's being attended by people from Mexico, from the Lebanon, just people dropping in because they can now. And I think that's a huge opportunity we wanted to take advantage of. And finally, it's to do with the lead institution. I work for the Open University. We uh, do open access online learning, freely available with a strong social justice mission. Um, and we've got great experience of designing online learning with communities and especially marginalized or disenfranchised communities. And so we can make that learning available all over the world for free. So we felt, okay, so let's look at the digital capacity and potential of these networks. So why Anglo-Celtic? I think I've touched on this. We want to decentralize the UK Ireland kind of dynamic here, thinking about, well, what's the relationship of Northern Ireland to Scotland? What's the relationship of the Republic to Wales? What are the, what, how can we capitalize on those relationships? And also decentralizing, as I said, the urban, notion, you know, so, so ideas that it, it's all about cities when it comes to sexual health and gay men, particularly, actually, it's, it's, it's rural as well. So really, really fragmenting all of that a bit. So finally, just to move on to the network aims. What we really about was what we want to do is to try and bring together both digitally and when we can face to face, um, advocates, activists, practitioners, clinicians, all of these people, all of these groups, in exactly the way that we're talking about today. We're doing it today, so it's a bit more of that, to share existing knowledge. So all these kind of online encounters that we have, these, the, the, these, um, these conferences and seminars and meetings that we have. But we also want to create new digital knowledges. Um, and one of the key things here is open learning resources. Um, one of our aims would be to bring together 
these groups of activists, clinicians, and et cetera, to develop online learning, an online learning that could be available to anyone around the world, but is coming from this particular part of the world, Ireland, uh, Wales, Scotland, but it's et cetera. Um, and, and we can do this digitally. Um, also research using digital approaches, you've seen from EMIS, et cetera, that online surveys, and now we're having to do online interviews and focus groups more and more, that is really opening up who we, the kind of people we can bring together around a focus group table or for an interview. And also the kind of campaigns we've just been talking about, um, these digital campaigns that can be shared that have, should have a much larger currency. And actually, you know, Mick's been talking about doing things in like four or five different languages. There's no reason why gay men in Dublin cannot be communicating directly with gay men in Sao Paulo. Um, and so it is exactly those kind of ideas of bringing those digital networks together. So we wrote a bid, it wasn't funded, boo-hoo. Um, so we, we are looking at trying to bring this, to, to take this forward um, somehow with uh, perhaps some um, online meetings over the next few months and organizing that. But what I would like to say is if anyone is interested in this as a concept, please get in touch with me. Um, my email is very simple. It's just peterkyo at open.act.uk. And thank you. I hope I haven't, I hope I've saved some time. I think over two minutes to one, sorry. It's not your fault at all, Peter. <laughs> thank you for that. Um, I think that's a really interesting uh, insight into uh, some of both the complexities and the benefits of this kind of new uh, form of networking that we've all been forced into, whether we like it or not, but to hear about the actual benefits as well as some of the challenges has, has been really useful. Um, again, conscious of the time, folks, Kieran, can I, we can take a couple of more minutes as well for our final panel, I, I presume, I'd, yes? I'd like to suggest, can we go forward until a quarter past one? Would that be okay with everybody? I mean, obviously, if people have to leave, you have to leave, but could we just add on 15 minutes and and uh, and give the panel a, 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 like a quarter of an hour at least? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. So apologies to, uh, thank you for, the, for all of those really interesting presentations, which we will refer back to, but to introduce you to the final uh, selection of panellists. Um, uh, again, as I've already mentioned, we have Martin Daverun, who is the Executive Director at the Sexual Health Centre in Cork, uh, an organisation, formerly Cork AIDS Alliance, who's been working for over 30 years in the area of sexual health. And Martin is also a lecturer at the School of Public Health in UCC. We have Adam Shanley, and Adam is a program manager of the Empower Project, which is housed, of course, at HIV Ireland. And an awful lot of you, I know, will be really familiar with the work of the Empower Project uh, across the board in the community from HIV testing to contribution and all messaged in, in, in a very uh, guilt-free and sex-positive way. Um, and then we also have Bill Foley. And again, Bill will be familiar to many of these. Uh, Bill was a founding member of Gay Health Action, uh, the Dublin Gay Men and Lesbian Collective, um, and has been involved in the Gay Health Network uh, in various capacities since the 1990s. So you're very welcome, the three of you. Um, and I know incredibly unfair because there's been an awful lot of information to process in the last two hours but actually in re reference to the previous panelists I'd love to ask by starting if you uh, guys um, Martin, Adam or uh, Bill have any specific questions to Harry, Peter, Nick, Niall or Porrick on foot of those presentations. I think um, it's one of the things that's happening in the network at the moment is revisiting our base um, in the light of our 25th anniversary and birthday celebrations, which is really about us kind of reviewing our governance codes and looking at our founding ideals and seeing for ourselves if a lot of those kind of issues are still relevant for us. So it's actually very interesting to hear from, from Harry and from um, Peter, in relation to the continuing value of um, networking processes. And I just wonder, is there anything that 
they might like to say to the network in, in terms of trying to bring the network into contemporary times as we face you know, the post-COVID world, hopefully in the next year or so. What do you think the components of new networks are uh, into the future and new messaging? I might just uh, add something just, I know within, I'm, I'm actually back in, in Ireland now, but I know in, in, in recent years within the Australian context, there's been a lot of discussion on trans men and how trans men are included um, broadly within in the work that we do. So I, I'm not sure what um, the network has been doing within that as well, but I think those are conversations that um, are often quite tricky um, in terms of how we um, have those conversations and how um, they fit within, um, I suppose, the culture within communities and, and um, how that may fit with older generations versus younger generations um, and stuff like that. Because I know that um, a few years ago, we had some of those complicated conversations and, and drove away forward often through engaging with those organizations. But I also think um, in terms of, um, and, and Peter touched on some of this around the decentralization. And I think um, as an island, Ireland, we need to probably look at, um, you know, the six counties in the North and what organizations are doing uh, the work. Cause I know the Rainbow Project continue to do a lot of work, but there are other organizations um, in the space who are doing a lot of work um, with say injected drug users, which is a new um, sort of HIV um, at risk group, I suppose, in the North. Um, so I suppose it would be about looking at those, building those links again as well and seeing um, how the network can reach out. Um, and I'm not sure what has been going on in the North, as I say, I'm only back um, in the country the last two weeks, but. Um, I'm sure I can be a link as well now that I'm back in the country and being able to um, set up some of those collaborations and, and meetings to take forward some new ideas, I suppose. I think just to, just to add to that, I think that, that, that I think it's vital that we, that we take advantage of the opportunities actually uh, that COVID has created. There's definitely the notion of a network is now changing radically and more fast than it used to before. And I, I actually have always thought this, Ireland specifically has a huge advantage because it's a diaspora nation in relation to the resources it can draw upon um, and the networks it can inhabit, um, which are just so vast. And um, I think thinking in that way, thinking diasporically, um and, and and thinking collaboratively across national borders increasingly is, is is important and actually making use of national borders to um get things done like those women on the condom trains did in 1970 whatever um you know they were making a point about national borders there and and, and really creatively doing it I wonder um, if I could specifically, again, I'm thinking there just of this conversation and what Maeve uh, mentioned earlier in her presentation, which I thought was really useful, because I think sometimes our sense of uh, the challenges that have been posed by COVID are actually still quite abstract when it comes down to how they're affecting services and how they're changing services. And to hear from Maeve about the really practical impacts and challenges they're facing is really useful. So I'm just wondering, Martin, uh, David or Bill, any opinion or kind of um, how has that been factored into your work or how are you planning uh, or strategizing around the kind of continued development of services in light of the, the omnipresence and unpredictability of COVID? The bulls for ourselves, um, like a lot of charities, being responsive is crucial to service provision and listening to the community that we're serving is absolutely crucial to that. Um, from the presentations earlier, we really welcome the SH24 model coming in. That pilot is just going to be excellent in terms of breaking down the barriers for equity of service provision. You know, 
an awful lot of sexual health services are used in urban areas and that's you know part and parcel with that's where the population masses are and that's where they should be but covid even with its barriers has actually given us an opportunity to reflect on our service provision so many of us this year have started condom postal services and that's been brilliant you know people don't have to come to a city center location or a sti clinic in order to access free condoms they can now get them post to them and that breaks down barriers they can actually access services at a point in time that's easy for them but also in a, in a manner that is accessible for them yeah i, I might um echo martin uh, there i mean we've i think obviously you know covid has thrown up an, a ton of challenges um but uh, just to go back to um to what was said uh, earlier in in one of the points Niall made about pushing boundaries is how you create the future and i suppose this is like what martin said you kind of gives you an opportunity to step back and reflect um, and and see how we can innovate and i suppose that's one of the things that we looked at doing for for empower looking at how you know the services that we have currently how can we operate them considering uh, we're in the in the middle of 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 covid so um i mean some of the community based rapid testing that we did obviously our venues are closed indefinitely um so we looked at um you know bringing it bring it in bringing it in house um, and offering it with all of the kind of COVID protections. Um, but then making sure that, you know, particularly because our services have been so dramatically scaled back and restricted over the last while, and obviously we spoke about the Guinness Health Service being remaining closed. Um, looking at how, how, how can we innovate, and I suppose what we, what we started was a um, HIV self-test uh, uh, service. So um, launching, you know, an online ordering service to get tests out to HIV tests out to gay and bisexual men and other men who have sex with men across Ireland. Um, and the demand for that has been incredible. So it is it is fantastic to see that, um, you know, the HSE is investing in a full STI screening service in that kind of a model. And um, self-sampling, albeit self-sampling, but it's it's still a, it's going to be a phenomenal um, innovation. And hopefully I'd, I'd be very confident that um, mm -hmm. Well, if if the reaction to our self test program is anything to go by, that the the full STI screen self sampling uh, pilot will be hugely successful. So hopefully that will become a staple going forward uh, of of our efforts. Um, and also, you know, I think what uh, Paddy had said earlier around you know collaboration never goes out of style. I think it's it's a really it's a, it's a nice takeaway. I think from from this and. Um, you know, networking and, and continuing to work together is, is so important. Um, and I think now maybe one of the big call to actions, I suppose, I know it's been mentioned a number of times, but is the continued closure of the Gay Men's Health Service. And, and this is something that I think we all really need to unite around. Um, I do totally understand the amount of pressure the health sector in, in all the many different ways uh, the health sector is under major pressure at the moment. Um, and I know our stakeholders um, in the HSE uh, um, are doing their, their level best at the moment. Um, but, uh, you know, HIV is, a, is a, an epidemic that we've been trying to get on top of for 30 years, and this is going to have a really detrimental impact on that. So I think if, if, if there's one call to action out of our networks, um, it's really to try and, and rally around and making sure that that reopens so that we can get back on top of uh, some of the great gains that we've made in terms of um, crap availability and um, like we're saying these innovations with testing um, and some of the wonderful inf uh, information and advice um, uh, work that's been done over the 25 years of the network and, and as we go forward so um, yeah. Thanks Adam, thank you for that. I think I'd like to just echo some of that as well just from a gay health network point of view. I mean I was struck by a point in May's presentation, there were the access to statistics around um, STI increases and HIV increases is difficult to access during COVID, but anecdotally we, we kind of get the indication that both are increasing during the COVID period. 
And that's incredibly worrying because obviously it's happening at a time initially when there were no services and now currently there are very limited services in STI um, screening and so on and, and testing from a, from a statutory point of view. Um, and I think so obviously that's informed uh, Gay Health Network in terms of kind of prioritizing a campaign around opening the, uh, the Gay Men's Health Service initially and also to uh, on that by increasing the service because as we all know the gay health network the gay men's health service sorry was under resourced and unable to meet demand when it was open so we don't just need it to be reopened we need it to be expanded and we need similar services to be developed in other population centers throughout the country so that people are not traveling you know across the country in order to access an essential and vital service so uh, there is an a, GHN are coordinating a, 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 a petition to, to lodge with the Department of Health, and that's, that's online there uh, through the site, I think. And also, uh, we will be putting out press releases and so on in relation to that, along with our partners in, in Gay Health Network. And I think the other thing that the COVID period has brought to us is effect of mental health and the significance of mental health for positive uh, expression of sexuality and how, how interlinked and important the two things are for each other. I mean, it's really important to maintain mental health, to have access to physical, emotional and sexual opportunities. And the denial of that, particularly the denial of that on a long-term basis, which is implicit within the COVID regulations, is really not acceptable and not workable. And so we need to try and incorporate the, the safety message into a pro-sex, a positive sex messaging at the same time. And, and that's essentially a, a conflict that's going on within that. But it is a challenge I think we need to begin to rise to because obviously there are potentially detrimental long-term mental health effects of curtailing people's uh, access to um, intimacy over time. Um, and I, I think that, as Claudia had mentioned earlier on, we are in the process of developing several pages for our website addressing mental health concerns and making these connections. So that is one of our prime uh, actions going forward into the future. Thank you, Bill. Um, folks, I'm just conscious of Hi. the time. Can I say? Coming up to yeah, Mick, go ahead. I just uh, it was to, to kind of <coughs> from earlier and from what people have been talking about. I mean, one of the things actually today we forgot was the, the vital thing around man to man.ie and the partnership. I mean, it was mentioned, but it, across the world, it's one of the few countries in the world where there's a, such a partnership to produce a, a national man to man uh, website with information and in different languages. So I think it's it's important and it's vital that it's kept going, like other sexual health stuff, and to acknowledge the partnership with the HSE and the sexual health crisis pregnancy. And the other one, then, Peter touched on it about um, transnational. I mean, IMIS, and I forgot to mention with the IMIS presentation, the community reports that we did for IMIS, the, the main one in the 49 countries, are currently I'm coordinating getting the part two done into um, about 12 languages. So that's that's actually meeting or being in contact with people in different countries. And then the other one is that we're going to do a part three on minority stress and coping. But one of the things I wanted to say, because Maeve is online and the minister, and MS 2010 um, was a big survey. And then we got together with the HVSC and the HSC and we built on that and we had Missy 2015. And that was the biggest survey ever in Ireland uh, um, of men and sex of men. And then we have, we've had um, uh, IMIS, IMIS 2017. And hence, or behold, in, a, in 2022, it'll be five years after the same as IMIS 10. So what I, we will be proposing from the network of work members is that we have a MISI 2020. Uh, or uh, 2022, and that we can build and from stuff that we're 
the data and all that we have now, we can build a, a, a comprehensive or such a survey. It doesn't have to be as big, but I think it's important that we work together and leapfrogging on things like that. And that combines the, the national with the international, I would say. So uh, we're working on that and hope to submit it with the, for a project for uh, to work in partnership and with the HPSC who are vital to it. And the MS Steering Committee, of course, was an international committee as well. That's all I want to say. Thanks for that, Mick. Folks, I'm conscious of the time. Uh, we've extended from one o'clock already and agreed to quarter past one. So um, I want to thank uh, Martin, Dale, and Adam for their contributions there. And apologies for, for uh, the tight time frame that we found ourselves in towards the end. Uh, but thank you to all of the panelists uh, for presenting. Mick, uh, Kieran, I think I'm going to hand over to you. And I presume many of the conversations that have uh, started here today will continue at Gay Health Network uh, meetings in the future. Uh, but in the meantime, I just want to say on behalf of myself, happy birthday to the Gay Health Network as well. Keep up the good work. Thanks a million, David. Um, I want to say that on a personal level, this has been a joy just actually reconnecting with so many of you who I haven't seen for a long time. So that's a buzz for a start. Um, it's been fantastic to have had uh, Minister Fian and Maeve here for most of the conference. And I really, I think I know that we all appreciate that. Thank you. Um, and I guess I'd like to to leave us with just a couple of, of closing thoughts. Harry, thank you so much for raising the issue of trans men. Um, I think that, that the issue of trans people is going to be at the forefront of our community and political issues. The LGB Alliance is getting stronger and gaining more, more traction in the UK. So far, they have not yet managed to, to develop much of a presence here in, in Ireland but I think we need to be vigilant. The LGB Alliance is an anti-trans uh, organization and is fostering hate. And, and we need to really be conscious of this and, and, and challenge that to, to prevent it uh, taking, taking ground here in Ireland. And Niall, your phrase, build our own sexual stage to dance on is going to live with me for a long time because we have been challenging sex shaming for years. We want to promote a positive attitude to sex while also creating greater awareness of the whole issue of consent so that it absolutely must also be okay for anybody to say no and be heard and respected. And I think that that's an increasing issue in our community in the context of alcohol and various drug use. So that I do feel that that is a role for us as well to promote a greater awareness of that and the vulnerabilities that sometimes we can experience because of either alcohol or, or various drugs. Um, and let me see. Yes, I am really pleased that the, you know, the issue around the gay men's health uh, service has been raised a number of times. Uh, I think we all, we all really believe that this is a very urgent issue and really does need to be addressed uh, very, very quickly for the sake of the thousands of men who have sex with men who use that service and who's, and the other services don't have the capacity to, to respond to that adequately. Um, and I'd then just like to remind you that David posted in the chat that DCU is hosting a conference on, on uh, LGBT asylum seekers. Uh, David, I can't remember the date. Yeah, it's April uh, 9th and 10th next April year. April 9th and 10th, okay, 2021. So, you know, save the date. I think this is a really, really important issue as we move forward and strive to create a more inclusive Ireland. Um, and with that, I'm going to just think about creating my own little stage here and dancing on it. But in fact, that's going to be by myself, really, sadly, at the moment. But um, folks, it has been an absolute pleasure. I'd like to thank you all. Thank you to everybody who presented. Um, 
Thank you to all of those of you who are attending who I can't see. Uh, so um, the, the chat has been fairly busy. I, I've made a few notes and, and we've raised a few issues. Um, there's one issue that we didn't yet raise, which is the Irish Prison Service. And what I said, Maeve, was that I would talk to you about this initially and that then perhaps we can we can think about going forward with, with addressing sexual health as an issue in prisons and also asking them to at least consider the binary nature of the prison system. So, but with that, I wish you all a really, really good rest of your Friday. Um, don't forget there's only, I think it's 25 shopping days or something like that. So, you know, um, and I hope Santi is good to all of you. There's only, there's only 40, 55 days till Trump is gone. Hey, <laughs> that's even nicer. Hey, so folks, thank you all. Um, this has been a blast and I think it's been really helpful and useful as well. Take care.